put it in here, but I can't, I can't do the screen. Welcome anymore. and good evening to the City of Shakopee City Council meeting for January 22nd, yeah. 2019. So if we could call the roll, please. Council Member Brennan. Here. Council Member Lehman. Here. Council uh, Mayor Mars. Here. Council Member Whiting. Here. Council Member Contreras. Here. Thank you very much. Let's all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Item number three, approval of the agenda. Mr. Reynolds, are there any changes, corrections, additions? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we have uh, multiple changes and then one addition. First of all, uh, I'd like it 5B. Let's see, it'll be 5B. Five, 5 B would be presentation of the 2018 Administrators Award. 5B. Correct. On item 8A4, the first paragraph where it mentions 2019 should all say 2018. What is this? 8A4. 8A4. In the memo where it says 2019 in the first paragraph, that should be 2018. <laughs> 8B2, the resolution number 2019 tax 006, the final plat of Lloyd's addition has a change that is on the table for your switch out with what you have in your packet. And finally, item 8B3, the beekeeping ordinance has been withdrawn and you will see that in the future. All right, uh, Councilor Whiting. Make a motion to approve the agenda as modified. I'll second. I'm uh, a second by Councilor Brennan. Uh, further discussion? 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 All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. A, a modified agenda has been approved. Item number four, consent agenda. Are there any changes, additions? Mr. Reynolds? Nothing from staff, sir. Councilors? Councilor Lehman. Move the consent agenda. I have a motion. Defend. And a second by uh, Councilor Contreras. Um, before we vote, we would read the consent agenda into the public record. Mr. Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Mayor and, and members of council. These are the consent agenda items for 20 January, excuse me, 22nd January of 2019. 4A1 approves the minutes from the January 8, 2019 meeting. 4A2 adopts resolution number R2019-013, which declares an intent regarding the reimbursement of certain expenditures from the proceed of bonds. 4A3 adopts resolution number R2019-008, which transfers funds from the Seal Coat Capital Project Fund to the Road Expansion Dedication Capital Project Fund and the General Fund. 4A4 designates the Shakopee Valley News as the official newspaper for the city of Shakopee in 2019 and designates the Valley website, excuse me, the city website as the official notice and advertisement venue for transportation project bids in 2019. 4A5 approves temporary on-sale liquor license, license to the parish of St. Joaquin and Anne at 2700 17th, 17th Avenue East on February 2nd of 2019. 4B1 authorizes the purchase of self-contained breathing apparatus equipment from Municipal Inter Emergency Services Incorporated. 4C1 adopts resolution number R2019-007, which approves the final plat of Sarazen Flats second edition. 4C2 accepts review of the conditional use permit and the mineral extraction and land rehabilitation permit for Shakopee Gravel. 4D1 approves renewal of the school resource officer agreement with the Shakopee School District for the 2019 school year. 4D2 adopts resolution, resolution number 2019-TAC-014, which approves the 2019 Drug Task Force grant agreement. 4E1 approves the establishment of a school speed zone adjacent to the middle property along 11th Avenue from Marshall Road to the East School property line. 
4E2 approves the purchase of a trailer-mounted sanitary sewer vacuum in the amount of $142,418. 4E3 adopts resolution number R2019-012, <coughs> which approves a wetland replacement plan for stagecoach to Southbridge. 4E4 approves the purchase of two plow trucks for a combined net price of $416,704. 4E5 adopts resolution number R2019-010, which approves plans and orders the advertisement for bids for the 2019 sewer service lateral pipe rehabilitation project, sewer 19-003, and the 2019 cured in place sewer pipe lining project, sewer TAC 19 TAC 006. And 4E6 adopts resolution number R2019 TAC 011, which receives a feasibility report and calls for a public hearing for the 2019 street and utility construction project, CIP 19 TAC 003. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Uh, I have a motion and a second on the consent agenda. The consent agenda has been read into the public record. There would be no further discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Thank you all. Item number five, now I'd like to call on any resident that would like to come forward and make comment on an item not on the agenda. Please come forward, state your name and address for the record and welcome. Mayor, council members, my name is Mike Redmond. I now live at 1845 Wyndham Drive here in Shakopee. I'm the superintendent of Shakopee Public Schools and I know I've met a number of you and just wanted to come and formally introduce myself to the group and uh, tell you how much my wife and I, we, we already appreciate the work you do and uh, you know Chief Tate and Chief Coleman and lots of other people in, in the city of Shakopee and we're both very, very excited to not only be working in this area, but also living in this area and uh, very, very happy with, with the decision to move to Shakopee. So just wanted to say hello and take a moment to introduce myself. Well, welcome to our community and thanks for uh, diving right into our school district and uh, uh, starting off 2019 in a great fashion with the Academy presentation a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Thank you for being there and thanks for all you do. Uh, welcome. I uh, appreciate you uh, coming in and taking over that position. And uh, if there's anything the city can do, uh, tonight we'll be deciding on a, a liaison for your board. But uh, uh, if there is anything, we'd love to partner with you. Much appreciated. I'm, yeah, I think the, the partnership in terms of the liaison officers, my impression is that's been very successful and we're very appreciative on our side of that partnership too. So. I'd like to thank you for your uh, willingness to come to Shakopee and tackle the uh, issues of the day. <clears throat> Wish you all the best of luck. <laughs> Hopefully you're very successful for all of our best interests. The school district and the city of Shakopee have had a great relationship for many, many years. Looking forward to that continuing. And uh, if there's anything any one of us or our staff can do, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you very much. Councilor Contreras. Just wanted to say welcome and thank you for stepping in. And um, hopefully, yeah, if there's anything we can do, we're here to help out. Thank you. I feel very fortunate to be here. So. Thank you, sir. Councilor Brown. Uh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to meet you and talk to you in other um, settings. And my three kids have all graduated from the Shockby School District, and they've all had a successful time at the Shockby School District. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about what's happening in the future for the for other kids. So am I, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Rodman. Thank you, have a good evening. You bet. Um, any other resident like to come forward and make comment on an item not on the agenda? Please come forward on an item not on the agenda. Seeing none, we will move ahead then to an ad item 5B, the Administrator Award, Mr. Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Uh, Mr. Kursky, can you please approach, approach the podium? In innovative organizations, leadership is often nervous, and that is a good thing, not a bad thing, because it means you are moving things forward and pushing the envelope. Now, granted, 
sometimes Mr. Kersky makes me a little more nervous than I like to be. Uh, but uh, this year he has been phenomenal in what he has achieved. And, and, and from my perspective, uh, we all work hard, but at the end of, day, end of the day, it's what we achieve that really matters. And uh, Michael, I, I actually had printed off the list of things that you've achieved this year, which is sitting up on the copier at the moment. Uh, but it is what has been uh, sent out to all of you as part of our 2018 uh, uh, review of our goals. Uh, and, and Michael's organization hit it out of the park. Uh, it is probably the most customer friendly uh, piece of the organization that we have currently. And a lot of that has to do with, uh, we don't deal in paper in planning anymore. Uh, that is all gone. All the plans are taken care of online. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the stewardship of Michael when he first came to the organization. Uh, I'm extremely honored and proud to present him, therefore, with the 2019 Administrator's Award. Mr. Kersky, congratulations, and thank you for all your hard work. No speech? No. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kursky, thank you very much for the dedication that you've provided to our community over the almost three years. The uh, developments that have come forward are class, top of the line class developments um, that you've helped shepherd in. Our community is very appreciative of your work in the last several years. Thank you very much. Councilor Lehman? Is that... Uh... Is that the rock that was shipped in from St. Paul? <laughs> Maybe? That's what, 250 grand or something like that? Thanks for waiting. Well, it's been a pleasure working with you. Congratulations on the award. It's well deserved. Councilor Brennan. Congratulations, Mr. Kursky. It's been a pleasure to work with you when I was on the Planning Commission, and I look forward to working with you in the future. You've done a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you for um, all your hard work and all your dedication. And I'm excited to, um, to start working with you. <laughs> Thank you. Let's move ahead then. Item six, business removal consent. There was none. Uh, item number 7A, vacation of a public utility is easement. And this is a public hearing. Councilor Lehman. Make a motion to open a public hearing. A second. I have a motion and a second by Councilor Brennan. Uh, further discussion, 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 all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Public hearing is now open. Michael will present. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This is a vacation of public utility easement for Scott County. So this is the current easement site. Um, actually runs under the existing building. As many of you know, Scott County is gonna be building a new addition on the front in this parking lot. And so as part of this project, they're trying to clean up some of their old easements. So this is the easement location. Uh, these are the two existing buildings and this is where the new building will go. So this will give you an idea. So this is the new building right here. And so as part of this, they wanted to eliminate that easement. Questions of staff? Councilor Was this an item that probably should have been done with, with the other addition of the building, the Justice Center? Uh, Mayor and Council Member, probably. But right. we're, as part of this project, we're trying to clean up a lot of okay. old items. Thank you. Very good. Other questions of staff? Councilor Lehman. Mayor, this says uh, that they'll provide any future easements on the site that's recommended by engineering and stuff. Do we foresee them, and where might they be? That, that site's going to be pretty full, it looks like. Mayor and Council, um, so there currently are some um, through the rear that serve as the existing buildings. So we're assuming that when they build the new building in the front, they'll probably consolidate that and bring it under the building, just like they have in some other areas. But this current easement is basically under the new building, so they wanted to get rid of it. So this is still a work in progress. We have not seen, um, except kind of the concept plans, we haven't seen the final plans yet. So there'll be future easements coming back probably. 
Mayor and council possibly, it depends what they do for as far as utilities. Um, I know engineering staff and planning staff have been working with them on a parking plan. That's been the most critical path at the moment. Okay. Other questions of staff? Other questions of staff? If not, thank you. This is a public hearing. Um, if anybody else would like to come forward and make comment on this uh, vacation. Anybody come forward and make comment on this vacation? Seeing none. Councilor Whiting? I'll move to close the public hearing. A second? I have a motion and a second by Councilor Brennan to close the public hearing. Uh, further discussion? <clears throat> discussion? Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Public hearing is now closed. Um, got a motion in front of us here, Councilor Lehman. Mayor, I just got a, one more question to staff. Oh. Is there any, do we know if there's any electrical or water utilities in this line or is that something that's separate, handled separately by the utilities? Mayor and Council, there is, outside of this easement, there's a separate SPUC connection to the building and if they need that moved, it'll be between them and SPUC. Okay. okay. Councilor Whiting. I'll move to adopt resolution number R2019-004, a resolution approving the vacation of a 25-foot wide public utility easement associated with the previously vacated Fuller Street between 4th and 5th Avenues, condition that the applicant provides the recommended easements to the public as requested by the city engineering and SPUC. I have a motion uh, and a second by Councilor Contreras. Uh, further discussion? Discussion? Discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Next up, public hearing 7B for the vacation of public drainage and utility easement. Um, this is a public hearing. Make a motion to open the public hearing. I have a motion to open the public hearing and a second. I'll second it. Oh, sorry. Councilor Contreras. Uh, Discussion, discussion, discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Public hearing is open. Welcome back, Michael. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So this is a vacation of public drainage and utility easement for Lloyd's property. Um, this you'll be seeing later on your agenda is the Lloyd's edition. This is part of the old checkered flag edition. Um, this was originally two parcels. As some of you remember, this was the asphalt um, recycling plant that never moved forward. Uh, Lloyd's has since purchased that property and you'll see later in the evening there'll be new parcels created with new utility easements but as part of this we had to get rid of the existing ones from the old checkered flag edition that run down the middle of the property. So the new plat that will be approved tonight actually creates two parcels, one up in front here and then a kind of an L-shaped parcel across the back. Uh, questions of staff, Councilor Whiting. So a question from Mr. Lehman. Was that about the middle of the, the cross where the uh, the figure eights uh, would meet? Uh, you probably... <laughs> There'll be some buses there. It'd be right about here. Oh, okay, you just missed it, okay. <laughs> Thought there was a reason we left some car parts out there. I have there to pull the old GPS <laughs> off the dash of the old stock car and find out. Sorry, I digress here, but... Uh, questions of staff? I... Uh, Councilor Lehman. There, I have one. This is a little bit unique and it's asking to pretty much vacate all easements including the utilities utility easements um, I assume that again any replatting any uh, easements that are needed for water electricity stormwater runoff and stuff they're gonna have to provide in the building process so mayor and council member I have up this is the plat that you'll see later that has the resolution on your desk so there are new uh, easements dedicated as part of this plat. Well, that's the new one we'll see in a while, and the yes, easements sir. are there all the way around the property. Yep. Yeah. Um, other questions of staff? Seeing none, Michael, thank, thank you. you. This is a public hearing. Anybody else like to make uh, come and make comment in regard to this vacation for Lloyd's property? Make comment on this vacation. 
Seeing none. Councilor Lehman. Motion to close public hearing. A second. I have a motion and a second by Councilor Brennan to close a, a public hearing. Uh, further discussion? Discussion, discussion, all in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you. aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Public hearing is now closed. Motion on the table. Okay. Councilor Lehman. Offer resolution R219-005, approving the vacation of public drainage and utility easements originally dedicated within lot A, checkered flag edition, Scott County. It's rated by document 944961. Thank you very much. Motion on the table, looking for a second. Second. I have a second by Councilor Contreras. And both these past vacations, just note that uh, Public Utilities has signed off on these um, in that regard. But uh, uh, motion on the table on a second. Further discussion? Discussion, Mr. Reynolds, would you have something or? No, sir, I'm waiting for the next. up for the next. Uh, motion on the table on a second. Further discussion? 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 All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you very much. Let's move ahead then to 8A1, Annual Review of Roles and Responsibilities. Mr. Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, thanks for giving me just a few minutes here to kind of outline uh, something I've done for the last several years, and that's talk about what our respective roles and responsibilities are in the offices that we hold. But let's talk about you first. Uh, this is one of the, the, the best quotes I think I've ever read about uh, elected officials. Running for public office at the local level is an irrational and unnatural act. You permit yourself to be scrutinized more than amoeba under a microscope for below market pay so that citizens can call you day and night. And for what? The right to make decisions that will tick off half the folks in town. So why do you do it? And here's the real reason. Basically to make a difference in your community and improve the quality of life of your citizens. And uh, I've often said publicly, I have a, an incredible amount of respect for you as a group of individuals. This is my profession, this is what I do. But all of you come from different walks of life and you put yourself up here to be scrutinized like an amoeba. Uh, and you're gonna make decisions, tough decisions that I certainly will never have to make, but you do. Uh, and, and those decisions may uh, cause uh, some grief, and that's, uh, it takes a lot. It takes a lot to be willing to do that, and I personally thank you uh, for, for your willingness to, to serve your community. So what is the role of an individual council member? Well, uh, first of all, it's important that city officials can be held personally liable for failing to act or taking unauthorized actions on the part of the city. It's very important that you understand that you essentially work as a body. Almost without exception, and there are a few, your role basically is part of this body that makes a decision. And oftentimes, uh, during discussions, I will ask for votes on things to make sure I'm getting what the body wants to do. Because sometimes a portion of the body wants to do this, and the other portion of the body wants to do this, which kind of puts us all in a bad situation. So if the body can then direct staff, we can do what the body wants to do. And so I always look at it as you are one organism, and I serve at your pleasure. <coughs> uh, and there are many ways to do that. Uh, we refer to we as opposed to I. There are clear and consistent rules of procedure, and we have those in place. Clear, agreed upon protocols. We just once again renewed ours uh, at the last meeting. All members receive the same information and respect for each other and abide by the decisions of the group. And sometimes it's necessary to have the respect for the position, if nothing else, and set clear direction and policy, which once again, my role is to try to make that happen. Effective council members participate on all issues and only abstain when you have an actual conflict. It's important to focus on policy and not politics and to discuss, debate, and disagree without fighting. Address the issues within your control avoid micromanagement, and play a supportive role in the group. Now let's talk about that role as the body. What does the body have the responsibility to do? Well, uh, one of the most important roles you have is to make sure that I'm doing my job. You supervise me, you formulate policy, 
and you exercise city statutory powers. That means that you essentially devote your time to basic policy and also it's very important that you have that role that neither I or staff have, you have that liaison responsibility to the members of the community. Well, we talk a lot about policy, but what actually is policy? Uh, the, 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 the typical guy on the street, if you were to ask him, might say something like, it's an arbitrary set of rules rigidly enforced, resulting in total frustration of employees in the community. Well, from a staff level, we hope it is a set of high-level decisions serving as a guide for lower-level decisions, but what in reality for you, it's three out of five votes. Three out of five votes are what determines what policy is, and then that's the direction that staff will then go in. The major areas to break it down for you in a little more detail in regards to what uh, the body's responsibilities are, you certify election results, you set rules governing how you proceed in a meeting, you exercise the, per, the city powers that are granted by the state, you legislate, which you do more of anything, which is passing ordinances, you direct inform, enforcement of city ordinances, you appoint the city administrator and some employees, you manage city financial operations, part of that obviously is levying taxes and approving the budget and uh, listening to Mr. Nelson give his uh, breakdown uh, uh, of financial conditions every month. You appoint members of boards. You conduct city intergovernmental affairs, such as JPAs we have with the school district, with the tribe, and others. You appoint to other governmental bodies. You protect the welfare of the city and its inhabitants. You provide community leadership, and you transact city business. <clears throat> The mayor has many roles under this, but probably my favorite is the city weed inspector per, per state law. And mayor, I have yet to see you out driving around town uh, inspecting weeds, but when you do, please let me know because I will be more than happy to go with you during that. That policy brought back. <laughs> <laughs> That's a state law. <laughs> but uh, the mayor is the official head of the city. Uh, he, he serves as a representative among the bodies. Uh, he's he's a, the formal greeter of, of, of important persons and others. Uh, he does all the signatures on, a, on uh, the executive documents, and he declares local emergencies, which hopefully we'll never have to do. My role uh, is, is, is set out by Shakopee City Code 32.15. And, and I'm going to, the quote from that particular section as it starts out is the chief administrative officer of the city, the city, excuse me, the city administrator is the chief administrative officer of the city and shall be responsible to the council for the proper administration of all affairs of the city. This includes supervising the administration of all departments, offices, and divisions. I'm, I'm responsible for properly screening and selecting recommendations for employment suspending or recommending for termination. You have the ability to terminate. I develop rules and issues, all administrative rules, regulations, and procedures. Prepare and submit an annual budget, obviously in close coordination with Mr. Nelson. Attends and participates in all council meetings, enforces all laws and provisions of the code. I have the responsibility to purchase or enter into contracts for previously budget items or services not to exceed $25,000. I make recommendations to you for actions to improve the health, safety, and welfare of the community or for the improvement of the administration as a whole and other duties that you might direct. I also have the responsibility to accepting resignations, which sometimes is not, not a fun thing, uh, except for department heads, police captains, and sergeants. And I hire, promote, and appoint employees for positions previously budgeted for, except once again, department heads, police captains, sergeants, or those above midpoint in the pay range. Um, I handed out uh, our latest hot off the presses manual for newly elected officials, or should, I should say elected officials and, and uh, uh, board members. Uh, so everything that I'm going into here, I'm not going to go, I'm just going to skim the, the treetops because there's a lot more detail there. Uh, but I mentioned personal liability. It's very important to understand that sometimes uh, you may be sued. Uh, that may be part of the job. And the city will uh, defend you in a lawsuit if you are acting in the performance of your role and your duties as council members and you are not guilty of malfeasance, willful neglect of duty, or bad faith. There are some exceptions to that. 
So if you intentionally hurt somebody in an intentional tort, for example, that's where there's some, uh, some harm that's occurred there, assault, sexual harassment, or defamation, you're on your own. Really quickly, talk about ethics, and most importantly is the concept of gifts. The bottom line is, if it's over $5, don't accept it. Uh, thank whoever's, uh, uh, you know, obviously uh, uh, telling you that uh, they have a gift for you. Uh, you know, they can certainly give it to the city, and we will accept donations on behalf of the city, which then the body uh, as a whole will approve. But for the most part, just simply stay away from it. Thank them for their efforts and move on. Conflicts of interest. Conflicts of interest occur essentially when you have uh, the ability to gain something from something that's in front of counsel. So anytime you have a, a you know, the easiest thing is a contract. If there's a contract that's before the counsel and uh, somehow you or a family member are going to receive some kind of benefit from that contract, it's important to do two things. One, let everybody know. And two, abstain from the vote because then you're, you're, you're out of the conflict of interest issue uh, and, and uh, uh, that should take care of it. There are many general rules and there are also some uh, uh, exceptions to the general rule, but anytime you have any questions about that, and I'm not gonna go through these, uh, please ask either myself or the city attorney. Open meetings, another important area. Once again, much more detail in the manual, but essentially uh, when it comes to open meetings, we want people to know what we're doing. In order to do that, they have to know where you're meeting and they have to have access to be able to come in. Uh, there are some exceptions to that. There are, you know, whether it's uh, labor negotiations, security matters, uh, misconduct, performance evaluations, attorney-client br uh, briefings, et cetera. Those are specifically ex exerted in state law that allow you the opportunity a lot of the time is in consola consolation with the city council, excuse me, the city attorney, uh, to go into closed session, in other words, not letting the public see what you're talking about, and making decisions. Uh, there's obviously a procedure involved in that, and whenever that occurs, the uh, city attorney will help you through that. Finally, when in doubt, real easy. Ask me or ask the city attorney. Uh, or you can also contact the League of Minnesota Cities. The League of Minnesota Cities is an ex excellent organization. It's one of the finest I've worked with uh, when it comes to uh, 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 state organizations. And that's it. Any questions? Questions of Mr. Reynolds? I just oh, have I had one. Uh, the tort, what exactly is that? Uh, a tort, well, I will, uh, the, the city attorney can certainly uh, answer that, but essentially a tort is where you've done damage to another individual. Yeah, a, a tort is um, when you're, usually when you're negligent and something happens to somebody else because of your negligence, something that you did. Um, in this case, I think the, the slide itself talks about intentional torts, and that's if you do something to harm somebody else intentionally. In that case, um, the city obviously would not represent you and, and defend you, you'd be on your own. So it's not actions that are taken here that might harm somebody's property. It's if we did it in, in, in individually. Correct, yeah, with bad faith or intentionally, something, something along those lines. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because sometimes uh, the decisions that we make uh, <coughs> do harm, and uh, that's, again, part of, part of the role. Councilor Whiting. I just want to uh, clarify, and I think I know the answer to this, but on the open meeting law, there's always uh, events in the community where uh, oftentimes more than two of us are at an event. Yes, sir. Would you uh, talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, anytime there are more than three uh, of you at any one event, we need to take a look at what the event is and what's going on. Because if there's anything that is discussed that might come before you in front of, for a decision in front of this body, then we can't have that uh, that happens. So uh, it's okay to be in social situations, and and uh, you know you can you can you can run into each other and, and talk about the weather or whatever. But uh, when it's when when three of you are together in the same place and time and talking about things that are in front of the, that should be in front of the city council, that's the issue. So if we just showed up happenstance by our town festival or something, not an uh, issue. We can be together, but we can't in any way discuss any city business. That's correct. Yes, sir. Because again, the whole point is that the, the, the citizens should be able to see what we're doing. Councilor Lehman. Um, serial open meeting 
laws. That's another one I don't think anybody's clear on with the change in technology. Please. Yeah, and yeah, Council Layman, that's that's a good point. And uh, so, what a serial uh, uh, meeting is is essentially where, uh, especially an, an email is 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 where you normally see it is where there is, there is a, a an email that go out, for example, from me, uh, and I'm talking about some item. And then uh, uh, one of you would reply back to all, or then there would be some kind of discussion back and forth over email. That is at the point uh, where, where there's an issue because you're using several, or you're using that to uh, essentially line up votes for your issue before it's coming in. The whole point is, is that all of those discussions need to be in the public and need to be out in front so people can see it. It's okay to have those discussions here. Uh, but uh, when you were doing it by email or, or, or trying to line up votes or, or having that discussion back and forth, that's a serial where if you take any one slice of it, it might not be a violation, but you add them all together and it is. So an example for like a recent example would be obviously a bunch of us had questions on this packet and you put out an email to all of us kind of listing some of the questions that you received not necessarily saying where you received them from. Correct, yeah. Just so that we all kind of know where some of the concerns might be. Right, yeah. Now, if, 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 if we then had a back and forth between all of us discussion on those issues, that's where it's a, a concern. Okay. But uh, part of my role is to gather that information and, and trying to make sure that all of you receive the same information, I'm then gonna condense it or you know, water it down in some cases, but then I'm gonna push it back to you all as a whole. And that can be then a basis for discussions once you come here. Yeah. Just to add to that, I, I would <clears throat> say that the safest course of action in, in that type of situation is if you're ever gonna to respond to an email like that, to just respond directly to, to City Administrator Reynolds. Don't reply all, don't uh, copy your fellow council members because that is essentially a serial meeting and, and that's a, a big problem, so. Council Brown. Could you clarify open meeting law and uh, social media? And you know that's that's a good one. Uh, and I'm not sure that uh, the rules are totally fleshed out, or, or you know the, the the cases have all been fleshed out on social media. But uh, and I would say it's always best to be careful whenever you're on social media, recognizing that your comments can reflect upon the city council. And sometimes if there, even if there is nothing currently on the issue in front of council, if it could come in front of council, uh, and, 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 and this isn't necessarily the open meetings question, but if it could come in front of council and you've already expressed an opinion on that, that could be problemsome because your role, you're supposed to sit up there and take the facts in and then render a judgment on something. So if you, if you are prejudging, that could be an issue as well. Uh, but social media, it really hasn't been fleshed out with, uh, you know, I, I don't know if uh, there's many recent cases that have come down that I'm not aware of, but. There are a couple of recent cases. The problem is they're conflicting with one another, which it just adds more uh, issues to this whole thing. I mean, it's, it's an area that uh, is evolving quickly. Um, I would suggest um, staying as far away from that type of thing as you can. I mean, obviously social media is a, a major part of our society today. Um, so um, just be aware of the fact that others are always watching what you're doing. Be aware of the fact that you represent the city. Um, and you know, you can certainly- uh, Could you uh, pull your mic a little closer? Sure, you, you, you can, uh, you, you can uh, the difficult thing is because you wear two hats. Sometimes you're uh, out there on social media as maybe a, a representative of the city. Uh, sometimes you're acting as uh, yourself independently from that. Um, but the, the safest course of action when it comes to that is, uh, if in doubt, talk to the city administrator, talk to the city attorney, uh, ask the league for an opinion, but there's, there's no good answer right now. Um, that's evolving quickly, and I think we're gonna see a lot uh, in the next couple of years on that, especially in Minnesota, because that has become an issue uh, very recently. Um, there were just a couple weeks ago was a, uh, an opinion from um, the states on an issue that happened in Victoria with social media, and, and you might have seen that. Um, and I would suggest that you take a look at it because it can provide some some helpful information. But again, um, that changes all the time. Other questions of uh, Mr. Reynolds? I always uh, appreciate this presentation. I think it 
it brings back actually some real basis for what we do and how we do it. Um, I think that's important and thank you. Other questions? If not, thanks again. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Let's uh, move on then to item uh, 8A2, financial review, December of 2018. Darren, welcome. Good evening, Mayor, council members. One second here. <coughs> no red arrows. Correct. <laughs> and I should take a few minutes just to kind of explain this financial report since it's new to a couple members here. Um, just to give you a quick overview, I'll probably go into a little bit more detail tonight than I thought he was already giving me the hook. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is our monthly financial report. Uh, we put it together probably a year and a half, two years ago or so, something to that nature. It's been kind of evolving um, ever since. Um, we would try to want to make it as quick and as easy for council and for the general public to understand. And so we went with these three arrows. We went with a red arrow, a yellow arrow, and a green arrow. So obviously green means good, yellow means we're okay, we're in the uh, kind of in the within a variance fluctuation um, that usually means about 10 per, within 10 percent plus or minus of where we should be at for the year so at the end of December we're obviously all the way through our year we should be plus or minus 10 percent of that that full year we're years worth of budget and then if it's a red arrow that means that we need to take a closer look at it something's happening there that you know maybe we weren't necessarily aware of or a lot of times there's expenditures or revenues that occur in spikes throughout the year. The revenues, for instance, property taxes only come in twice a year. So our revenues will lag for the first six months of the year until we get a, that first half tax settlement in in June. So you'll see that as the, as the year progresses, we'll see, um, we'll see red arrows in there. It doesn't mean anything's bad. It just means that something's amiss at the moment. And that's due to um, fluctuations in revenues or expenditures. Or it could mean that there's, you know, knock on wood, but we have, you know, 10 snowstorms and we have a lot of extra salt or a lot of extra overtime that we're paying for, and those are things that we need to, to look at or address. So that's a little bit of overview on that. Um, I, I won't typically spend a lot of time on each individual line item, just kind of point to the ones that are, are drawing our eyes to. Um, but I want to go through the revenues with you real quick tonight. Um, I kind of talked a little bit about the taxes. We receive those twice a year. Um, June and December, we receive our, our big um, half of the year tax payments. And so we see we're at about 98%. We still have a short settlement um, from October 15th through December 31st that the county settles to us here now in December. Um, it's not a, a big dollar amount, but it's, it's still a little bit of amount that'll help shore up that little bit of fluctuation there um, at, from that 98% to probably just under 100%. Um, there's always some delinquent taxes out there that we collect in future years and such. Uh, special assessments, that's really related to delinquent garbage bills. Um, our contract with Republic ensures that we pay them any delinquent uh, re, um, any delinquent garbage bills, and then we assess the property owners for those delinquents. Uh, so those property taxes or those special assessments are, are accounted for in that line item. Licenses and permits. Um, as you can see, we had a, a phenomenal year there. We're at $2.6 million of, of revenue for the year. Um, that surpassed uh, the revised budget, which was revised up what was it, $536,000 that we revised it up by. So that what, it was $1.3 million or so, $1.4 million. It's, the budget's now one9 We still surpassed it by $650,000. A lot of that's due to building permits, and we've, we've had some good years in building permits, and that's, that's great. Uh, we've been kind of inching up our budgets to account for those, but we know that, you know that can change on a dime as well, too, and we can have something happen, and building permits stop, and now we have those buildings in place, we need to make sure that we have the money in place to perform those building inspections for the next one or two, three years, however long it takes to complete that, that building project. Um, and I should note that the 2018 revenue was about $200,000 more than the 2017 revenue as well, too. Uh, so it was a, a really good, good year on that end of it. Intergovernmental revenue, um, that is, let me catch my breath here. Um, that's over budget as well by a little bit. Uh, we received a, a CDA grant for about $87,000 related to the, the West End study that uh, wasn't accounted for in our original budget piece of that. So uh, 
that should be sufficient on that end of it. Charges for services, uh, we recorded $550,000 of monthly revenue uh, just for December in charges for services. And a lot of that is contractual overtime with PD. That was $58,500. Um, $187,000 from SPUC for our, our revenue sharing piece of that with a franchise fee. And then we had $275,000 of recreational revenue um, come in in December as well too. So that's a, a big chunk of that as well. Fines and forfeit um, is a pretty minor column or a line item there. It's only got a budget of $800. A lot of that's related to our lodging taxes uh, we have, if they pay late, if after the 15th of the month, we charge them a $100 uh, late fee. So there's a couple of those that happen throughout the year. Um, and then we receive some revenue from some driving diversion um, program as well too. So that's accounted for in that line item. And then our miscellaneous revenue uh, was up at about 125% of budget as well too. Uh, we had some good interest returns this year. Um, investment earnings were up, which is, which is good. And we'll talk a little <coughs> bit about that uh, in a couple of minutes. But then we also had a $50,000 admin fee from BHS in regards to the bond that they issued to build their, um, to build their facility. It was a conduit debt issuance and we received a $50,000 admin fee um, for that purpose, for that bond issuance. So as you can see, your revenues are 103%. This isn't, these aren't the final numbers by any means. Um, this is a snapshot in time. So this was taken last week there are plenty of revenues yet to come in. There are expenditures yet to be paid for, for 2018 and there are journal entries yet to be completed. So we'll have another, um, until the, probably mid-February by the time we have a kind of a, a really good handle on where our general fund sits for the end of end of the year or so. Um, but right now we're, we're sitting good and I expect that to get even a little bit better on the revenue side. Well, scrolling down to the expenditures here, you can see you're at 96%. Uh, we still have $1.1 million left in the budget for, 20, for 2018. Uh, but as I mentioned, obviously there's expenditures yet to be paid uh, for services that were rendered in, 20, in 2018 and such like that. A um, couple of the items that, that pop out, uh, planning and development, there's a green arrow, arrow there of 70, that's at 78% and they got about $200,000 left in the budget. We had, I believe it amended the 2018 budget to account for some comp plan expenses that we thought were gonna take place in 2018. Those expenses are really take place in probably 2019 now. So uh, we expect planning to be under on that side on, in 2019 and we'll have to account for those funds then in 2019. Uh, natural resources is under budget. Um, they're at 44% of their budget. Um, that is due to not award, awarding a, a tree contract service in 2018. Uh, I guess some bids for that tree trimming or pruning um, contract came in too high and we it deemed it um, that we wouldn't, wouldn't accept that contract for this year. And I, I guess there are plans for 2019 to uh, revisit that contract and go out to bid again in 2019, so. And then your unallocated line item. Uh, there's not a lot of expenditures in that account. Um, the main thing that we get accounted for in there is we have a contingent, some contingency dollars, so if we had you know, a major disaster or something like that. We got about $110,000 budgeted. We didn't obviously use that in 2018. Um, so that surplus is sitting there. Uh, the expenditures that we did have, I believe a lot of them were related to some of the annexations. I know we pay the, the Jackson Township, um, some of those, the new, under the new um, orderly annexation agreement, those seven years, or I believe it's seven years worth of taxes and such. And those are paid for out of that line item as well too. So, and there's some other miscellaneous items that can't be allocated specifically out to other departments and such. So some office supplies and such like that. But I would expect um, expenditures to come in under budget. We're at 96% now. Uh, they should come in well below that 100% mark. So any questions on the? Questions on this, uh, Councilor Whiting? Uh, should we make a line item for the township <coughs> repayments? Uh, we kind of have within the detail of that, of that unallocated budget, we have some dollars allocated in there that we, um, you know, will only be annexing, annexing a certain amount each year. Or well, it could be a fairly large acreage wise, but um, tax wise, if it's farmland and such like that, it's not as um, tax heavy as some of the other types of, of properties and such. But we'll, that's one we'll keep an eye on. Councilor Contreras, did you have a question? Okay. 
Councilor Lehman. Mr. Nelson, the uh, other financing totals, other financing totals for 1.5 million. What is? So that was in. That's the 2017 column. We, if we look up there. Yep. So that was. So we have a couple transfers in. We have a $125,000 transfer in from both the sanitary sewer and the uh, storm drainage fund to account for some operational type of, of costs. And then the $1.8 million transfer out last year was basically the surplus that was in the general fund. We transferred, I think we transferred. Debt service. We, we, we did transfer some to the debt service, but we also transferred a, a lot to the, in, the self-insurance internal service yep. fund yep. Um, as we're looking for um, the, the health insurance to become self-insured on that end of it. I don't recall <laughs> what that amount was. It was like $600,000 or something to that nature, I believe. Um, 660 maybe? Something to that nature. So it was part of that, it was part debt service, and I think a, a little bit went to the capital improvement fund as well too. So we'll do some look at something like that this year as well too. We'll obviously probably have a, a surplus there. We wanna make sure our fund balance stays in that 35 to 50% of what 2019's expenditures are gonna be and such like that. So, um, and any surplus dollars will move into like the capital improvement fund is a good place because it's a lot of one-time expenditures and such like that. And that's really what those dollars are, so. Other questions? Uh, the snapshot in time looks great. Thanks. Thank you very much. And so here's the community center uh, with the ice arena and community center slash sand venture um, combined. So if we look at th the revenues for the ice arena, they're at $719,000 uh, through this point in time. That's a little bit under budget by about $40,000 or so, uh, $50,000. Uh, but they do have about $65,000 of revenue yet to be billed. Or that was, it's already been billed now in January, um, but it hasn't been accounted for yet in the December financial statements. It's we bill that in January, but if that got paid in January, that book as a 18 it, income? It, it books as an 18, yep, because it was a service that was rendered in 2018, yeah. and we billed it in 2019. And uh, even though we get a check in 2019, we book it back into the, the year it was earned. Um, so if we look at the revenue, or the, the revenues that will be at budget and um, they'll exceed last year's actual revenues as well then too. Um, ice reading expenditures, they're about $39,000 if we look at both the wages and the operating expenditures, they're about $39,000 below the, the budget at this point in time. Um, just like all the other departments within the general fund, there'll be expenditures yet to be incurred. We have utility bills that are a month or two behind um, on those service dates and such um, and some of those types of things. So I would expect the expenditures to come in um, at that target budget at this point. So looking at the community center revenues, you're at $1.3 million. Um, that's $500,000 more than last year, which is, which is good. Uh, 2017, obviously the community center wasn't in full operation at that, at that time. So it's not a, a good apples to apples comparison, but um, we did revise we did revise the budget up in the revenues for the community center. So that 1.1, it was originally, oh, I don't know if I have that number, but um, you did surpass obviously that budget amount by a couple hundred thousand dollars. And I know we revised that number up from what uh, we had originally projected back in the late stages of 2018 or late stages of 2017 actually. So things are looking good there. And the same with the expenditures, uh, both should come in at or below the, the budget allotment for the year at this point in time. So. Everything looks good there. Um, one point of note is this deferred revenue, and I should explain that a little bit. The deferred revenue specifically re relates to annual community center memberships. So when you purchase a membership for, an an for a one year's time frame, and if you purchase it in December, you're only, in the past years before this last year, we would recognize that in the year that you purchased it. So if you purchase a year's membership in December, we recognize an entire year's worth of allotment in December, knowing that you had full use of the community center from December through the following December. Now what we do is we recognize it month by month. And so when that membership is sold, we'll recognize one twelfth of that membership that month, the second one twelfth the next month and so on and so forth. 
And so what this does is really shows a snapshot in time of how much revenue, how many sales are out there that we haven't recognized the revenue yet for. And as you can see, there's an actually, there's a drop in that amount at December 31st. Um, and it took me a little bit of time to, to dig into this and understand it as well too. And so that's a $63,000 drop. And so looking into it, at the end of 17, we did a big push for annual membership sales because uh, we had some pretty big increases in membership rates coming in in 2018. So we really, promotion-wise, we really pushed it to say, you know, now's the time to buy your 2017 mem or your 2018 membership before prices go up on January 1st. Uh, so we had, we had some big dollar amount sales in December last year. So looking at our total memberships now, we have less annual memberships right now, but we have the same total membership. So we're seeing a shift from annual memberships to monthly memberships. So some of those members, instead of paying annually at one point in time, they're now paying <coughs> monthly. Um, so our total revenues are still higher because we still have the same number of, of same number of, of members, but our rates are obviously higher than they were at a year and a half ago or, or November of seven, or December of 2017. So, so we keep an eye on that as the, as the year progresses as well. Any questions on? Questions on the community center? Councilor Lehman? To make sure I'm reading this right. So if I go down the year to date actual 2017 middle column, Community Center and San Venture, that 968, 486. That's what the loss was for that year? Correct. And if I go over to year to date actual 18, that's what the loss is projected to be for 18. Correct. So the loss is coming down. Correct. Yep. So I know it's this has always been difficult for me because sometimes you put them in parentheses, which would normally be a loss in my it, life. It, it, it is. It's the way this program is the way this program combines combines the numbers, and it's. And then when when the other numbers that are a loss aren't in parentheses. Yeah, yeah. You got to kind of you get. It takes me time to look at this one as well too, and, and understand which way is which on on it. But you are correct in, in that uh, that assumption. My wife would never let me get along, get away with that. <laughs> but the, you know. I look at the deferred, I'm trying to re understand, I know what we're trying to do is book it by month, but the, the 192 is positive money. That is truly owed to us, is that not correct? Correct, yes, yeah, so that's cash that we have in the bank that we haven't recognized as revenue, that we'll recognize as revenue in 2019. Three years ago, we would have already booked that and yep, that would have been and driven, the, right. driven that even down lower, Right. but now we do it right. month by month, so that, Money in the money in the piggy bank that's going to come month by month by month. Right. It's okay. it's a better it's a better accounting of of how the financially it's I got it's it. going. Yeah. And, and, and the difference between the two fifty five seven eighty six and the one ninety two seven sixty eight is the sixty three zero eighteen <laughs> without <which, laughs> which is what we're going to collect for eighteen is the sixty three. Yes, we actually collected the, that difference. Probably is is collected then in twenty January, but it was a service rendered in, yeah. in eighteen, so it's going to go back into eighteen. Yeah. Um, so one ninety two will go into nineteen. Yeah. So we recognized two hundred fifty five thousand dollars through twenty eighteen, and we'll recognize that one hundred ninety two through twenty nineteen plus <coughs> any additional sales that happen each month. We we look at that change in that change from month to month. So. All right, and lastly is our quarterly portfolio report of our investments. And this is something we started just a quarter or two ago, and it's something that um, in our drive to receive a AAA bond rating, this is one thing that the bond rating agencies look at is that their council is not only aware of our financial standings, but they also understand or have available to them some of our investment records as well to understand um, what we hold as a, as a city in our portfolio. So I just want to go through this briefly. Um, we are guided by a, an investment policy that the, the council has approved. Um, I'll probably be looking at that investment policy and just kind of refresh it a little bit. It's a good policy, just needs to be uh, probably refreshed a little bit just to um, update some things that um, aren't major, but just want to make sure that when bond rating agencies come out this spring and summer that um, everything's on a on a 
nice new basis and nothing old on, on in front of them. So um, our investment policy is guided by the acronym SLI, which stands for safety, liquidity, and yield. So we wanna make sure that our investments are first of all, first and foremost at safety. We don't wanna lose any principal balance. We don't wanna invest in, in things that we can't invest in, or we don't wanna lose any of that, um, those tax dollars that are, that are in place here. The second is liquidity. We need to make sure that we have funds on hand to pay our bills each, each week, the pay payroll, to pay our bond payments. And so we gotta make sure that we have our cash or our investments laddered out specifically so that we know uh, when we have the, the appropriate needs for cash. Then lastly, it's yield. And so uh, we're basically guided by state statutes on what we can specifically invest in. And so yield is kind of that third rung piece of it. So we'll make sure that we try to maximize yield, but we also make sure that we're abiding by the, the safety and liquidity piece of that first. Um, we've had a good year from an investment standpoint, um, relatively speaking, since the last decade, basically. Um, interest rates have increased and we've, we've seen some, in, some benefit to that as well across all of our funds that have cash balances. So just wanna look at our performance quickly here. If you look at the one year piece here, um, you can see in this light blue column is the income return and that was 2.16%. And that's our interest that we actually received. And so we haven't seen 2.16% in, well, if you look out here, it's been over a decade right. and it, it doesn't feel like it's been a decade, but it's, it's been a decade, it's crazy. So um, hopefully things are moving in the right direction. I know the feds seem like they may have stalled out now on interest rate increases, uh, which may be beneficial to us if we're issuing bonds later this, this summer and such like that. But if we can kind of stay where we're at, um, at least we're, we're seeing some returns instead of you know, buying a five-year bond for a percent and a half and it just, it just eats you alive. So, so we're seeing some good things there. Very good return for one year. Right. Um, and so here's the makeup of our, our main portfolio. We got about $46 million in this portfolio. We also have another one that has um, a, anywhere from a million dollars to $10 million, depending on the time of year that I really use for my cash, um, cash needs basis. So it's a lot of, of short-term stuff that's just um, in there. And this is the main stuff that basically stays and just it turns over and such like that. We received $266,000 of interest in the last quarter. Um, our market appreciation actually went up $527,000, which is, you gotta take that with a grain of salt a little bit, is that we only, when we buy an investment, we hold it to its maturity. So we're not out there day trading. So if investments went up $500,000, we're not selling everything off that day to put it into cash and then to look for something to buy the next day. Uh, we buy them to hold. And so in previous quarters, we've probably seen that number decrease as interest rates were rising our portfolio, the items that we had in our portfolio were obviously bought at a, at a lesser interest rate, so they're not as marketable as the current markets. Well, at the end of December, the markets kind of hit a skid right in December, you know, November, December, the markets uh, took a pretty good dive. And so our portfolio actually looked pretty good then compared to what was available at, at that point in time. So um, don't pay attention, a whole lot of attention to that number, but it does come into play with our annual financial savings. We, gotta, we have to do a mark to market adjustment, but it's a one day snapshot on time thing as well too. And here you can see our asset allocation off to the right. Um, here's the safety piece, You know, 42% of it's in US Treasuries, municipal, municipal taxable bonds, which are you know, the same as us issuing bonds. It's other entities that are um, issuing bonds and those are all highly rated, um, AA, AAA type, type entities and such like that. Uh, then the Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae type stuff and, and CDs as well to make up part of our portfolio. Councilor Lehman. Mr. Nelson, can you explain that to everybody that may not understand that we don't just have $46 million sitting there in investments for our rainy day? <laughs> a absolutely. Um, so we have many funds across the city. We talk about the general fund specifically because that's the one that um, a lot of our tax dollars go into, but we also have, we have internal service funds. We have a building internal service fund, equipment, um, park maintenance, all those types of items that have, that need many thousands of dollars a year to operate. We have those on hand. We have our utility funds, which are uh, funds that have been accumulated by the rate users. Um, 
So those are, there's several million dollars in there that need to, we need to operate as well too. So each fund has a specific purpose and a specific need and um, funds are dedicated specifically to that. So if it's in a debt service fund, the money that's in there is dedicated to that bond payment only, it cannot go to helping Steve plow the, plow the streets and such like that. So um, each fund is basically its own little business and it needs to operate kind of standalone there. We just take all the cash and combine it so we can um, have a little bit of, of um, better ability to, uh, in, to invest in large dollar amounts. So. Economies to, of scale is by what putting it all to together and trying to invest and make a dollar on it, we're actually, theoretically, if we could make a whole bunch of money on our investment, we would actually save the taxpayers money. Absolutely, and that's why we try to maximize that yield. Obviously, we, we abide by that investment policy, but maximizing that yield helps drive down the amount of tax dollars that we really need. So, And we always allocate our interest earnings out based on the cash balance for that month, so every, every fund gets their appropriate um, interest earnings for each each month. Um, just wanted to point out here. Just this is just some. It's some complicated stuff, and it's not always easy to completely understand. But looking at the portfolio, our acquisition yield was two point three four percent this year, which there again, we haven't seen one and a half percent. For a couple, for many years, on that end of it, so it's it's good to see those those go into the portfolio and help uh, build that for the future. And here's a, a listing of our top ten holdings. As, as you can see, uh, with forty five percent of our portfolio in U.S. Treasuries, um, it's no surprise that a lot of those are, are U.S. Treasury related. Um, there's a the Energy Northwest, I believe, is in is, is a Washington bond. Um, a Fannie Mae's are in there, Freddie Mac's, those types of things. And so here again, um, looking at our acquisition yield, look at that over the last three years, it was 1.26 in 2016, and now for the fourth quarter it was 3.27%. Um, so those are real dollars that are coming into, into the city's funds. And here's just a little bit of economic overview that um, our investment manager provides a lot of this information to us on a monthly basis as well too. But looking at the, the yield curve, we've kind of pointed that out the last um, few quarters as well too. And the blue column is the current yield curve at December 31st. And it's not quite inverted. It's a little inverted. If you look at the one year to five year um, bonds, you can see the one years are actually higher than the five year. That's not necessarily a good thing from the from what my brokers have said, that if it becomes inverted, that's usually an indication that there's a downturn in the economy coming or a, a, a recession type thing happening. But um, the good news is that they typically look at the two year and the 10 year. Um, and those are, although they're very close, they're not inverted at this time. So uh, we hope that that continues, that it, it's a, a normal yield curve and not that um, inverted piece where short term investments are worth more than, than longer term investments and such. And that was about it. This was just some, a little bit of information that was um, provided as well too. And uh, should point out that the, the feds, they did cut interest rates in December. Uh, initially throughout 2018, they talked about or not cut interest rates, they, at, they increased interest rates in December. Um, but they did initially in 2018 talk about probably three or two to three interest rate hikes in 2019. Now it's probably none at this point in time, one or none. Um, if not, maybe a potential cut. So um, if it's an interest rate cut, that usually means that there's an ec economic downturn as well too. So that's making sure that goes back to our general fund review of our building permits and such and that, you know, keeping an eye on, on how those are rolling and, you know, seeing if we're seeing um, any stagnation on that end of it. And I don't, you know, talking to Mr. Kursky at this point in time, we haven't seen that here on a local level. So we'll just keep keeping an eye on, on those types of things as well too, so. But other than that, that's about all I have. If you have any additional questions. More questions. Talk about our, uh, the portfolio size was 46 million and you know, that's, that's all, a majority of that is made up by dedicated funds that uh, can only be spent in certain areas. 
and money that will be spent over the long term. Our reserve that we talk about that is some, you know, 35, 40 percent, uh, that is for short-term liquidity that we use over the year because those big pieces of those taxes only come in twice a year, right? Correct, Mr. Mayor, you are absolutely right on that. So we maintain in the general fund that 35 to 50 percent of our expenditure budget as a reserve. And the reason being is that we get our taxes, as you mentioned, twice a year. So we do have revenues that come in pretty consistently from month to month, but if we didn't have those, we'd have to rely upon taxes to get us through for six months until we get our first tax um, statement on that end of it. So if we didn't have those come in, we would be, you know, we, if we didn't have taxes coming in, obviously we're not gonna uh, survive uh, in our general fund. And so uh, making sure that we have plenty of reserves on the hand there to get us through to that next payment um, is needed, so. Other questions, comments? If not, thank you, Darren, very much. It's a great overview. Thank you. All right, moving ahead to item 8A3, City Council Mayoral Liaison Appointments. The memo from Lori that uh, we discussed this at the last meeting. I have been in contact with most of you to discuss these and uh, work out a couple of couple of kinks, but uh, I think we're all in agreement now, uh, hopefully, on the liaisons, um, as stated. So um, I know that a couple council members have been going to uh, liaisons already. Um, which is great. And with that, um, just looking for a motion to approve and discussion. Councilor Lehman. I'll make a motion to approve the mayor's liaison appointments as presented. Uh, second by Councilor Whiting. Discussion, Councilor Lehman. Mayor, I didn't participate in any because I wasn't officially appointed. I didn't oh, that's fine. Walk it out of place. <laughs> that's fine. Well, I, we did talk about that. I did, you know, I shared with you that the 169 uh, Mobility Coalition was a group that former council member was on and found out that they no longer meet and they were disbanded. Um, but uh, thank you everybody for put, helping to put this together and uh, these will be for two year terms. Um, and we'll do this again in a couple years. I have a motion and a second for their discussion. Discussion, discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion passes. All right. Let's move right ahead then to 8A4, extension of Republic Services contract. Nate, welcome. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I'll just go through a brief presentation and uh, Um, so what we're asking for today is to extend the contract with Republic Services. Uh, back in September and then again in October, we discussed with the council what kind of parameters you would be looking for in order to do such an extension. And at that point, uh, going back out to bid was also on the table. What you gave to us was that we were looking for options with regard to routing and collection, meaning we wanted to have some way to help assure that we had lighter trucks on streets that could potentially be damaged. If you look at number nine of the amendment, it does give the city a specific methodology to uh, approach Republic to make changes and they must in good faith discuss um, those routing changes. You asked that we worked to improve the customer experience. Um, and I've got a couple of anecdotes on that, but uh, most notably in number five of the amendment, uh, Republic is a signing and operations supervisor. And I can tell you that over the course of the last couple of months, um, I've definitely seen an improvement from an operations perspective um, on that. You wanted us to explore the possibility of smaller receptacles, um, but we came back and reported smaller receptacles didn't really make sense because you'd be looking at a 15 gallon container. We do currently have an every other week service, um, but Republic didn't do a whole lot to advertise that that existed. So in this amendment, number 10, 
uh, requires that Republic does their due diligence to make sure that people are aware of that option. And I think the city is gonna do some stuff in our newsletters and, and Facebook and uh, other methods that we have to tell people about it as well. So I think we hit those pretty well. Um, with regards to customer service specifically, um, I kind of break it down between billing issues and operational issues. Uh, from a billing perspective, Republic, especially over the last year, has been really receptive and efficient in resolving billing issues. Those numbers have been going down pretty significantly. Uh, when something raises to my level, it's pretty much within 100% of the time resolved within 48 hours. Um, the timing of price changes caused some customer service issues last year. Uh, so in this contract, we set forth clearly in number two the timing for how that would work throughout the rest of this contract. It also does lock in the collections price provided there aren't any significant changes to where we are tipping the refuse. Again, the operations supervisor, like I said, this has already been in place. I have noticed, uh, I haven't really even heard anything on the operations side since December, early December. Um, one of the cool things that happened, and um, this is just one example of a few, uh, back on January 8th, if I don't know if you remember, we had some really high winds going on and we got an email at uh, 153 from Republic saying we've got some problems going on. Uh, garbage is being blown all over the place. Uh, we've told our drivers to tip the carts back up and if there's something right there, then put it back, but there might be stuff blowing away. And then you can see about two hours after that, we tweeted it out um, and it was viewed quite a few times. So just because that operations supervisor position, we were able to kind of head off what I kind of imagine would have been some, some issues. Uh, additionally, uh, most of the customers are gonna see a decrease for 2019 if you approve this extension. Um, the fees for the 30 gallon a month uh, will be going up. That's because the fees are broken down into two different sections. There's the collection fee, which is what it costs to get the truck to your place and take your trash and your recycling, and then the disposal fees. The disposal fees are actually what's going down. Um, so th for the 30 gallon container, the disposal fee isn't going down enough to offset the changes that we're making on the collection side. Another thing that we're doing in this amendment is that we're getting the city away from cart ownership. Um, right now, Republic has two or 300 of their owned carts out there because we have run out. Um, back in 2013, when the city went with Republic, we purchased about 24,000 carts. For various reasons, growth of the city, damage to the carts, and not having warranty on those carts, that was a decision made back then, um, we're down about 2,000 from the original 24,500. Uh, if we were to continue purchasing carts on our own, right about now I'd be standing in front of you asking for about $150,000 in new uh, recycling and waste carts. Uh, with this plan, I think it does a better job of helping ensure that we recover the initial investment, which was just over a million dollars back in 2013. Um, by increasing the cart fees, by having Republic start to fill in uh, we're going to be able to recoup the about $630,000 that's left on that Interfund loan. Whereas I have a suspicion that if we were to continue purchasing new carts, uh, it's possible that we would end up in a situation where that loan never gets completely paid off. Would you agree with that, Darren? <laughs> we spent more time than seems reasonable on this. <laughs> uh, what about the ownership of the carts? We still retain ownership of our carts. And... Obviously, Republic owns theirs. That's correct. The carts and, that are uh, out there that we own right now, we will still own. Yeah. Republic, when they put theirs out, they will still own those. And who's in charge of maintenance? Republic is still in charge of maintenance of both types of, of carts. both types, okay. Yep. Councilor Lehman? Do we know what Republic's charge for use of their containers might be? We do. In the first year of this agreement, they would be charging $1,950 per quarter. So the way that this works right now is that each customer is charged a cart fee. As it sits today, it's $0.37 cents per cart per month. The customers remit that cart fee to Republic. Public pay, Republic pays it to us. Over the course of the last several years, that fee has come in at about $105,000 per year. 
we're technically about $80,000 behind in the repayment of that loan because those fees have fallen short. So what they're going to be doing is they're still collecting that cart fee, which it's proposed in front of you to increase it to 55 cents, again, so we can recoup that buried cost that we already have. Um, they will still be collecting the cart fee. They will still be remitting it to the city. However, each quarter they're going to take $1,950 off for their carts. Going forward, we're going to match that dollar amount up more closely with the actual number of carts out there based on a 50 cent per cart per month cost. Councilor Whiting. You know, when we first decided to get into the cart ownership business, uh, our research, because we were expanding into a new contract, we realized that uh, the carts were the easiest way for the the collection company, in this case Republic, to fleece our citizens. And we, and it makes it extremely difficult to change to a new hauler um, because they take all the carts and we'd have to go through the whole cart process again. So there was many reasons why we got into the cart ownership business. And I understand there was, and we did a loan on it from another fund. I understand that it, creates some other concerns with damage and issues and, and uh, managing carts. But there were some specific reasons that helped our citizens and why we did that. And um, I have some concerns of giving that back to them. And Mr. Mayor and Councilor Whiting, it, and without going too far deep into the weeds on you know the decision, I, I did read and, and watch and understand why that decision was made. There were, Two things that I don't think were foreseen that happened that caused the plan, by my interpretation at this point, to not work. The first one was the carts that were chosen were of, shall we say, less quality than several of the other options. I'm guessing that was done to meet a budget of some sort, but they routinely broke, um, were down almost 10% over five years. Uh, and the problem is, they don't have a warranty. I mean, they do, but it's a five-year warranty and it's declining. So now when I send a thousand carts back, uh, as of today, pretty much we're only getting a hundred. So you can kind of see where the problem comes into play on that front, where we're starting to decline out of being able to even raise the revenue that needs to be raised to pay off that loan. Um, that was probably the biggest, the biggest issue with this. Um, payoff plan. The other thing is um, when the administration originally proposed the cart fee, it was proposed at 55 cents and then it was taken down to 37 cents. Um, so I think where we're sitting right now is we are in a hole. At the moment it's $83,000 um, and I, every time I've looked at it, I just, ha I'm not convinced and I don't think Darren is that we're going to dig our way out of that by continuing to put more money into it. Um, so I guess there's a trade-off here somewhere. And those are the two big reasons why I think we're kind of looking at moving this direction. So back on the carts, I mean, we did what we did several years ago. Um, now we're coming up on five years into it and looking at an extension and kind of going the other way. But let's just fast forward in eight years, in three more years, where the the fund the loan will be paid off. Well, Mr. Mayor will be two years shy of it. Uh, somewhere in 2023 would be when when it would be paid off. Okay. And this contract extension goes through 2021. Again. Probably own less cards. <laughs> <laughs> Right. We would own I less mean, carts. Our projections are that at that point in three years, we'll be sitting at somewhere in the range of 18,000 carts that we own that are still serviceable, 17,000. Councilor Lehman. Let me try a hypothetical. My cart breaks. We extend this contract. My cart breaks. I don't get a city cart. I get a Republic cart. I'm still paying for the city cart, right? You're still going to be paying, paying the fee. 55 cent cart fee. Okay. 
and that money is going to go to who? So if it's year one, let's just say it happens the day after this extension is valid. Um, generally speaking, that money is going to be coming to the city still because we're just doing a flat fee for simplicity's sake through the year, year one. In years two and three, the following two years of this agreement, we're going to more accurately tune it into how many carts Republic has actually got out there on the streets. Technically, for the most part, by and large, I would say the city, the money is coming into the city. How is Republic gonna get paid for their cart? They will get $1,950 per quarter this year during 2019. And Next year, in October, November, we would negotiate how many carts we think they're going to have out there and agree to a different number the following for 2020. Would, would that come out of the 55 <clears throat> cents per yeah. month charged or would that be a rate increase? That would or, come from the 55 both. cents. It wouldn't result. That particular instance is highly unlikely to result in a rate increase because at 55 cents per cart, the city is recouping its investment on all fronts. They're going to get like eight grand in 2019. In 2019, From just under $8,000 for using cart their carts. Mm -hmm. We will get the rest. And we get the rest. So the city right now I'm anticipating will get just under a hundred and I think it's just $142,000 to go towards paying off that loan. Republic will get about $8,000 during the year for the use of their carts. And then we're going to fine tune it. Okay. Councilor Lehman. You know, an open system tends to, to drive customer service because if you don't like who you got, you just fire them and get somebody that'll be better at their job. I understand it's hard on the roads, poor trucks, I get that. Some people won't have them and they'll use somebody else's service and they just won't pay for none and that's not acceptable either. Some will dump. I understand all the problems associated with it and that's kind of why back then I agreed, okay, we'll go to a closed system. But now that I'm in a closed system, the problems with it are almost as grave as an open system. They're just different problems with different costs. So, I mean, I'm looking at your, your fees and it's like everything's going up substantially, it looks like. You're telling me it's going down, but it's like 18, I just go right down this list on this page and it's all increase, 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 increase. And, and it's like the whole point is to, to bid it out is to, is to have lower cost. Everybody's saying services are going up, but we don't even know because we can't even bid it because we want to extend it. And then we don't know how we're going to deal with the second year and the third year and what the long-term ramifications are. I think if you read about the garbage industry, though, um, I think you'll find that dumps are closing. There's, uh, the choices to go to these dumps are getting fewer or farther away, which drives up expenses. Also, we talk about the, we haven't talked about it yet, but recycling and everything I read is a recycling market is in the tank and has been in the tank and looks like it will remain in the tank for a while. Um, I do like a closed system because I think it does bring efficiencies. Um, customer service, they had a, our community representative, uh, uh, they had a change, right? They had a gentleman, now they have a gal, and actually that, during that period, there was some rough customer service. But actually, since that, uh, the gal came on, the customer service has has, I think, gotten much, much better and very responsive. And uh, she sat here during that, the aftermath of that billing thing last year. Um, I have taken less calls about garbage, at least for me. Um, and I, I look at this and I know we had a previous carrier under the closed system and uh, we extended them as well. Um, and then made a, a wholesale change to this new provider. But uh, I th from what I see, I think that the actual rates are going down slightly uh, for the 60 gallon standard users. Is that correct, Nate? 
That's correct, Mr. Mayor. Both the 60 and the 90 will see a decrease at the bottom line. Here are the rates here on the screen. Yeah. Yeah, I was looking at the detailed one here where all these rates, they're all going up. So that, <clears throat> this up here is kind of the summary of what your normal customer bill, it's, they do quarterly, but per month would be. You know, when we, uh, anytime we change to a new collector, there's all sorts of concerns and issues. Um, a lot, of, a lot of our drivers that we had are going to be new drivers. They don't know the system. They don't know the area. They might miss a few cans. There's, there's so much. We'd open such a can of worms by changing. As far as the open and closed system, uh, it is extremely difficult to go from an open to a closed. And I think there's a lot of value in having the closed system. Um, you don't get to negotiate your own trash company, but we do, all those problems you mentioned, uh, we don't deal with. Uh, when there's trash all over the road from an, some truck blowing around, you, no one's taking the credit for it or they're blaming the other carriers for it. Yeah. We have one guy we point to and say, hey, you're, you're the hauler. So uh, um, I'm not willing to look at the opening that back up. But um, in this case, um, you know, without the cart concern, you know, that's, that's a few details I, I can live with. Um, but I, I think the extension here is probably our, our best option. In three years, we can take a look at it again and uh, look at that and see where we want to go there. Okay. Um, just uh, do you have more to present, Nate? Uh, nothing specific, but if I may, Mr. Mayor, uh, to Councillor Layman's point about the costs associated with the systems. In 2009, the state of Minnesota did a comprehensive survey to take a look at what the cost was um, to the residential customer on a monthly basis for a 30, 60, or 90 gallon service. And then 2009, uh, for 30 gallon, the average cost in an open system was $22.64 a month for a 30 gallon. For a 60 gallon, it was $25.46, and for a 90 gallon, it was $25.46. And I guess I'd just take a look at those rates that we have up there today and say, and there may be some advantages. Um, you're right, customer service might be improved by the competition, but I think it's pretty clear in the quantitative data that the cost to the customer ends up being lower. I also could say back in 1991, it was only 17% cheaper to have your garbage collected by, I think it was um, BFI or um, precursor to waste management, can't remember the name of the company, uh, it was only 17% cheaper than it is today to have a 90 gallon container removed in 1991. So if that had followed a trend of inflation, you'd be at something like $30 per month, so. Ultra Lehman. Mayor, I don't disagree with uh, Councillor Whiting's comments. My comment, it, uh, having five trucks go to the same neighborhood five different days a week, it's going to be killer on the roads, right. and the Absolutely. cost of that is yeah. substantial. So I, I get that part. Right. But when I'm looking at this chart, it's telling me that the weekly refuge collection, all sizes, currently is 468. It's going up to 515. Mm -hmm. 2020, it's going up to 531. 2021, it's going to 547. So there's an increase across the board. Right, and then your recycling collection, 267 to 305 to 314 to 324, so there's an increase. Cart fee, NA currently, 22 cents and 19. So these are all increases, and yet you're telling me it's a decrease. If you track down to disposal further down. Okay. You'll see the decreases there. And in the in the negotiations, do they, what's it take for them to come back and change that disposal back? Disposal is actually a calculated rate based on the actual cost to dispose of the trash. So the part part of the reason why that cost is going down is because where we were taking the waste um, has closed, 
And it just so happens that where we're going to take it now is going to be significantly <coughs> cheaper. Um, we were trucking it to Elk River and we were having it incinerated, but because that place has closed down and the only two other incinerators in the area, in the metro area, um, are at full capacity, we're now going to have to be landfilling, which is decreasing the cost. Which makes no sense. <laughs> well, the state says you can't do that, yeah. and then we'll end up getting, paying well, more to, uh, to truck it somewhere. Uh, the burners, and then they can't even run at full capacity. I know the one right downtown Minneapolis is running at 78%, and they've asked three or four times to go uh, just up to 85 or close to 90 uh, and have been denied, denied every time. And I find that really odd that to incinerate that garbage and it meets all the EPA coming out of the stack thing. But why don't we run that a little more efficiency for all the money that is involved by Hennepin County in it. I mean, I know that doesn't affect us, but it's just one example where we're seeing a burner in Elk River close and now the, you know, there's less choices and, and an outcome that, that may not be fully desirable today, but maybe we'll see that cycle come back around while there'll be more burners. Uh, uh, you know, I don't think that you can have it both ways. Uh, the landfills are getting fuller and the, to burn it more efficient, efficiently and effective is kind of the way to go if we can get there. Mr. Mayor, having ran a county that was a 23% owner in an incinerator, I can tell you with 100% certainty that within the next two years, it is impossible for another, bur another incinerator facility to open. GRE might reopen, but that's exceptionally unlikely as well. Once they shut down, the spin-up takes longer. So I would say it's highly likely that during the duration of this contract that we will be continuing at roughly these disposal rates. Is that just the cost to get into that business or is it the environmental? Uh... The permitting processes, the cost to spin up your, um, when we shut down our incinerator for a three month period, spinning it up was nearly cost prohibitive. The county that I work for had to put $350,000 into it just to start it up. Oh. <laughs> and we were only 23% or something like that, to that effect. I was like a race car. Yeah. <laughs> uh, more questions of staff on trash and garbage? Councilor Whiting? You know, I had some concerns about the carts, um, but I appreciate you uh, explaining the detail and uh, getting a little better understanding for that. Um, I still want to keep an eye on that so that we uh, don't get, our citizens don't start getting taken advantage of on that cart side. Um, but with that, I'd offer to approve the first amendment to the service contract and contract specifications for the comprehensive solid waste and recycling services contract between the city of Shakopee and Republic Services. I'll second that. I have a motion and a second by Councilor Contreras. Uh, further discussion. Um, I hope the customer service continues on its upward tra trajectory that I've seen. Uh, uh, better top of the line customer service is a uh, really the call of the day today on any business, and I think that should improve. Um, I believe that this will help our um, loan fund situation um, drastically. I, this saves our, our city about $140,000 from my calculation, um, and along that with a better service, I hope, uh, I we demand in our community. So. Um, I want to thank Nate. I know we started this a while ago, and Nate did uh, put a lot of effort into this. You have a trashy jobs. No, <laughs> thanks. Uh, further discussion on the motion. Further discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed. Motion uh, is approved. Thank you all very much. All right, moving forward then to 8B1 zoning text amendment for off street parking requirements in the city code. Kyle, welcome. Thank you, Mayor.
I apologize. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Members of the Council, uh, before you this evening is a zoning text amendment request to the off-street parking requirements, which are in City Code Section 151.141, 151.142, and 151.143. So uh, staff has initiated the zoning text amendment uh, for, to the off-street parking uh, requirements in the zoning code. Uh, some of the reasons for the revision were to right-size the regulations for the number of spaces based on the use, uh, include a provision for maximum numbers of spaces. Uh, we wanted to also modernize and add flexibility to design, uh, such as adding pavement requirements in residential areas, uh, allowing compact parking spaces. That's not something that was in the current parking standards. Uh, allowing proof of parking, which is a common practice uh, today, and also including bicycle parking. We also wanted to remove unnecessary uh, areas and requirements and unnecessary classifications, and we wanted to clarify common areas of confusion. Uh, you'll recall that uh, in November, uh, the staff, re staff brought forward this text amendment. Uh, it was heard at the Planning Commission on November 8th and then by the City Council on November 20th, where there was significant discussion on some of the requirements, so we're coming back with some changes. Uh, so I'll be outlining the presentation. We have some new members on the council this evening, so I'll be going through the presentation. I'll also be outlining the proposed changes from no the November 20th meeting. So some considerations for this zoning text amendment is to review the problem areas in the current code based on our uh, staff experience. Uh, we've got some staff that, are, uh, that have been at the city for over 15 plus years, so we've got a lot of experience with the Current parking regulations, they've uh, mainly been in the same state that they're in with uh, some minor amendments over the years, but we've got a pretty good grasp on what, uh, what things work and what things don't work. Uh, we were looking at current plan planning industry techniques um, and also calculations for, and requir for the requirements. Uh, we also reviewed regulations of other comparable cities uh, when considering uh, the right sizing the regulations for Shakopee. We also reviewed multiple aerial photos and we performed site visits to uh, parking facilities in Shakopee and also in other cities. Um, I'm a resident of the community, so I see things not only uh, during the workday, but outside of the workday. Uh, so certain areas are definitely noted versus other areas where there's, pro where there's problems. Uh, some of the proposed changes after the November 20th City Council meeting, uh, there was discussion on the length of RVs that were permitted in urbanized residential zoning districts. Uh, so the proposed change that was removed, uh, the language that's in there is uh, reverts back to the language that was cur that's currently in the code. Uh, we added a section allowing vehicles that are currently being washed and dried to be parked on the grass. Uh, that's included in the proposed amendment. Uh, we clarified the trigger for bicycle parking when a $100,000 addition or alteration to a building uh, that it only applies to commercial buildings and multifamily, multifamily residential buildings greater than 12 units. That is included in the proposed ordinance that's, uh, that was attached to the report. We revised the parking maximum to no more than 20% above the minimum requirements to apply to only two parking facilities that are greater than 30 spaces. Um, and we clarified the section on expansion and alteration of uses that uh, applies to commercial, industrial, and multifamily residential sites, not to single family or uh, single family or twin homes. So some of the main changes that were proposed, uh, this is going back to the original presentation from November. Uh, some of the main changes that were proposed for the residential portion of the ordinance is the requirement to pave parking areas in residential zones, except the agricultural preservation zone and the rural residential zones. Also uh, adding a limit of 45% paved area in the front yards of single family homes uh, and a clarification on the trailer length limit of 20 feet for trailers parked in backyards. Uh, so there is an allowance for uh, trailers to be parked on turf uh, in residential zones. And so there's been some uh, problems with the definitions that were in the current regulations on, on interpretation of the trailer length. We also uh, revised the multifamily parking uh, requirements to be based on the type of unit uh, versus 
having a blanket regulation uh, for all types of units where a studio apartment would have the same parking requirement as a three bedroom apartment. Um, that's how the current regulations are in place. So that's not falling in line with current industry techniques and also the current developments. Uh, we've seen a few multifamily housing developments um, by some larger developers and uh, got to speak with them on what sort, of, uh, what sort of requirements they find acceptable, what do they do in other cities. Um, it's definitely a concern for them because if they have unhappy residents or people that don't want to lease there because they don't have enough parking, that's definitely a problem that they're, that they're concerned about. Some of the main changes for commercial would be allowing up to 20% 20 uh, 20 of spaces to be proof of, proof of parking. What proof of parking is would be a space that's set aside so that uh, say a developer, a, a commercial developer comes in and they say, your requirement is uh, burdensome to my site. Uh, we don't, we've done extensive studies that show what the <coughs> amount of parking we believe we need is and we don't need to uh, provide all of your requirements. Um, we have an allowance in the draft code for up to 20% of the parking to be considered as proof of parking. That's area that could be developed as parking. It has to be outside of easements. It has to be uh, easily constructed. Um, it has to be ready to go, pretty much shovel ready for adding, adding that parking spaces. If it's found that the parking is needed, uh, then they would receive a notification and it would be up to the developer to uh, install that parking. Uh, we also included a change to allow up to 10% of spaces to be compact car spaces. Uh, we don't wanna go anything above that um, based on the numbers of compact vehicles. Again, this, is a, this is a, allows uh, de developers flexibility. They wouldn't be required to do this. They would have the choice to do it. And there would be a specific size um, and they'd have to be signed for compact cars. Also, we would include uh, allowing administrative review of shared parking um, and increasing the allowed proximity from 300 feet to 500 feet. Currently, a developer, if they're looking to do shared parking, they would have to come to the Board of Adjustment and Appeals uh, to have that. Um, there hasn't been that I'm aware of any cases where the board has denied any shared parking requests. We haven't had problems with it. Uh, we'd like to remove that and streamline the reviews uh, for that and also increase the, increase the distance. So some additional requirements are, would be the addition of a bicycle parking requirement. Uh, it's based on vehicle parking of two parking spaces plus 5% of the required vehicle parking. So one bike space per 20 vehicle spaces. Um, there is also an exemption uh, for areas that don't generate, that wouldn't be seen as uh, generators of bicycle traffic. Uh, so there is, an, there is an exemption for that for certain uses that wouldn't require that. Uh, provision of the parking maximum uh, would be based on 20% of the minimum requirement for facilities greater than 30 spaces. Uh, and exceeding the minimums requires pervious pavement. That would be, um, there's a number of different uh, types of materials, but that would, uh, in the draft ordinance, it allows the public works director discretion for the types of uh, pavement that would be a pervious pavement that would be acceptable for our area. Also, we removed uh, unnecessary use classifications, uh, airports, vending machine establishments, riding academies, taxi stands. Um, and we also added some uh, requirements like grocery stores, laundromats, and pet daycare and boarding. Those are uh, re relatively recent. Um, pet daycare and boarding is a recent classification that wasn't in the code previously. And uh, grocery stores have their own unique uh, set of requirements um, versus standard retail. And Cleaning so- Cleaning up the code and bringing it current. That's correct. Uh, so we did some, also we did some adjustment of required spaces um, in the, in the, that are in the current code, like funeral homes currently, the regulation is one space per employee. Uh, we wanted to and make that based off of uh, other uh, assembly type uses that would be similar to funeral homes. Uh, furniture stores, uh, you can probably think of a couple furniture stores in town that have some pretty empty parking lots. Um, and so we wanted to adjust those requirements and have a sliding scale. Uh, medical and dental clinics, uh, we reviewed, uh, reviewed different sites and made a minor change there. Manufacturing, we made a change uh, out in the industrial park. You can see a lot of, uh, there's some empty spaces in some of our industrial multi-tenant buildings. Uh, so we made a minor change based on that and the addition of pet daycare and boarding. 
So this is an aerial photo of an area that you're probably uh, quite familiar with. This is the Target and Coles area. You can see this is from our 2018 aerial from uh, the spring of 20, uh, 2018. So you can see where areas that uh, snow had been piled up and hadn't completely melted. There are some areas that you can probably recognize that were uh, areas that uh, you've probably never seen a car. Um, some of the goals of this uh, ordinance, of the proposed ordinance change, would be to allow flexibility for the redevelopment of some of these parking lots. Uh, as we discussed at the last council meeting in November, you can think of a couple areas around the Twin Cities, Southdale specifically, where they're developing their parking lots um, and uh, creating some uh, exciting projects. Um, we'd like to have the flexibility for that and see uh, reduced amounts of impervious surface and uh, encourage the right sizing of the developments and have um, buildings and places for residents to go rather than just parking for cars. So this is uh, another area, this is an aerial photo of uh, 12th Avenue near County Road 83. Uh, that shows multiple different types of uses. We've got industrial users on the north side of 12th Avenue, and we have commercial and uh, hotel uses that are on the south side of 12th Avenue. So you can see at the furniture store, there's uh, not a lot of parking there. Um, Goodwill, uh, there's parking, there's a fair amount of cars that are visiting there. Holiday and Express, uh, this is Fairfield Inn that's under construction. Uh, we did not adjust our hotel requirements. We were, um, we were pleased with how those were functioning. Um, but as I said, we adjusted the furniture store requirements. This is a multi-tenant building that's not fully, um, wasn't fully occupied in this picture, uh, but now a portion of the building has been used for furniture, um, which is not as parking intensive. But they do have an allowance for additional parking should other users move into that space. So this is just showing examples. Uh, this is a screenshot showing uh, multiple different types of uses in the area and that we've got an overabundance of parking currently. So more adjustments. Uh, we en enhanced a sliding scale for parking requirements for, ret uh, for retail. Um, currently it's just one per 150 square feet for retail uses that are less than 50,000 square feet and one per 200 uh, square feet for uh, site for developments greater than 50,000 square feet. So as we as I proposed, we added an additional scale. Um, so have a sliding scale to right size that development, right size the parking requirements. So some of the ordinance reviews that are some of the history on this uh, and on November 8th, the Planning Commission uh, unanimously recommended approval of the proposed amendment by a vote of seven to zero. On November 20th, the council reviewed the proposed amendment and provided comments which were noted earlier. With that, I will turn it over to the council for any questions on the proposed changes. Thanks, Kyle. Questions from staff? Council Whiting? Um, going through on your commercial side of your parking, um, the only concern, and I think you have an answer here, but it, if we reduce the amount of parking for like a furniture store and that use changes, is that where your uh, proof of parking policy would come into place? Uh, that would be if they were going to be getting rid of parking. Um, say, like, if you're t uh, to understand your question, say you have a furniture store right now that has a large parking lot and somebody well, else we, moves in. No, we have one that we build, and they have the reduced parking. Okay, yes, they would. Uh, they would be able to provide eighty percent of the requirement. If it's found that they need to provide more parking, then they would be directed to provide that parking. They would be. They would be required to show proof of parking areas on their development plans when they come in, they'd have to have adequate areas that are able to be developed. They can't just say, well, I'm gonna put some parking over here and well, it's a drainage and utility easement for future utilities or for a pond or something else. It has to be area that's available to be developed into parking. Okay, uh, if I may follow up. The, um, you know, I didn't get a chance to really absorb this. I was concerned with some other issues on the last time we talked about this. Um, when we talk about the residential, paving residential driveways and parking areas, um, after we discussed this, I saw, noticed quite a few in our older part of Shakopee that don't have paved concrete or, or asphalt parking spaces. And when we, if, we to, if, if we adopted this ordinance as it is right now, 
those people that don't have paved parking or paved driveways, they would go into uh, what's uh, known as the, the legal non-conforming, correct? That is correct. They would not be required to, if they have an existing gravel driveway right now or parking area, they would not be required to pave that. They would be considered a legal non-conforming use. Now in a situation with legal non-conforming, doesn't that create issues if someone's trying to refinance their home or uh, fix their roof or different things like that because they're in a legal non-conforming status? Wasn't that some of the issues we had, Councilor Lehman, with some of the other legal non-conforming? Yeah, we did. But th that legal non-conforming was uh, the use was inconsistent with the underlying zoning. Yeah, that was, the, that was that the actual use wasn't permitted in that zoning district. So, so this wouldn't cause issues for refinancing or for the transfer of prop sale transfer. So they'd be legal non-conforming, but if they sold that property, then they'd have to... Nope, they, it, it, they, remain, it remains as it could it remain. remain as is. Okay. If someone wants to build a new house and they've got a, there's a vacant lot, they'd have to pave their driveway. Okay. So in the, or this, if they're building a new drive or building a new driveway on an existing property. Okay. So the, the requirement for new development would be the driveways and the places, but everything else, including access to, uh, what if they're building a new garage along the alley? That would have to be paved, correct? If there is not an existing driveway there, then yes. Okay. If there was an existing gravel driveway in place and that where they're currently parking cars and they build a garage next to it, the gravel driveway would be able to stay. All right. Come Thank off you. the gravel driveway on your new paved. Well. Councilor uh, <laughs> Lehman. Mayor, I've got three questions. Sure. Um, and I'm in the ordinance, page two, uh, number one. Last part of the sentence, just not clear, but if I'm reading this, it's talking about off-street parking facility located outside of required setback shall be provided for at least two vehicles in all single family dwellings. A suitable location for both a garage measuring at least 20 by 24 foot with a 10 foot driveway, which do not require a variance, shall be provided as indicated as such on a survey or site plan to be submitted when applying for a building permit to construct a new dwelling or alter an existing garage. So if you wanted to alter an existing garage, you have to show a place for a 20 by 24 foot garage and a 10 foot driveway. That would be for constructing the new dwelling units. This is current. That's this is a current regulation that's in the code. This is not a proposed change. So this is mainly the, for this. This would be development. A developer comes in and they're looking to plat new lots. They have to have the ability to have a garage or a two-car garage on their sites, and that's something that was adopted in the code. So the or altering an existing garage is in, is inaccurate. Because this is saying a garage is already existing. They'd have to have parking areas for that. That's why we have, uh, that's why we have the setback requirements for detached structures. Like facing an alley, a detached garage has to have a 20 foot setback to allow for parking of two vehicles. So it would meet that standard. If they're facing the, if the doors, the overhead door faces parallel to the alley, there would have to be the space for the cars to actually park there. Okay. I'm just confused about the existing garage part. Number three, location off street parking facility in a resi zone, residential zone shall not be located in the front yard setback or in a street side yard setback, period. Single family residential units, which is what I thought it was above by saying residential zone, no more than 45% of a front yard area may be paved area for driveway and parking of vehicles. The front yard is determined as the area between the front building line of the home and the garage and the front lot line. So... You can't count the front yard setback. Right, but you have to cross the city's so, right of way in order to enter your property. Right, but they don't so, want a short driveway where the back end of the car extends into the front yard setback and or I've seen it where they encroach on the on a sidewalk. Okay. So you have to be clear of that. Yep. 
I just like I said, I'm trying to make sure I'm, no. I'm understanding these three areas. In in my on my street when they redid the street, there's a driveway cut in my curb or a driveway in my front yard. I've never used it, but I wanted that cutout put back because I'm going to be using it. Um, and I want to make sure I didn't have it put in for no reason, and now the rules change. Well, you don't have a sidewalk. Nope, I don't have a sidewalk. Oh, but yeah. I have to cross the city yeah. portion from the curb back to the lot line. Well, and if you pave that, then you, you could not park where it's infringing on the front yard setback. Yeah, as, as, long as, you're not do, as long as you're not paving more than 45% of, of your front yard, you can have your parking area there. Okay. And then the, the residents <laughs> down by the courthouse on 4th Street that are across the sidewalk and hanging out in the street because that's just the way Old Shakopee was built at the time, what do you do? Nothing. Legal non conforming. <laughs> right? You could look at that a number of ways. You could look at it in the right, right of way ordinance. Um, well, they've got no choice. It's the way it was built. And there's no, no other. I know the specific example you're thinking of, they could park in their garage, but they don't. But well, I, it, it, I'm sure there's some of them, but there are also a lot that where the houses are two feet off the alley. They're too close. Right? They're actually two feet off, or even in the alley. You open when you your door and you drive in your garage. Uh, the old Napa building comes to mind where it's, it was right on, let's say with Rock Spring, you know. There's just a lot of that old stuff around town. The last one I have is page three, um, very bottom, number one, where this is getting back to the unpaid residential parking areas and driveways constructed prior to. I still believe that you should be able to have a, a C5 driveway. And the reason I think that is because these are just natural minerals. And you know, it's kind of ironic, but we pull our water right out of the aquifer, which happens to be minerals. The minerals are not bad for the water. Actually, they, they recommend them. So you're getting a little more <clears throat> infiltration, which is what we try to do with our holding ponds. And uh, you're not getting as much runoff. And the runoff that you do get is natural mineral filled instead of petroleum distills. I just would add, if, unless that car is leaking oil or fluids and things, it well, could still perk. Well, if you get that on percolate. blacktop, it's going to run right down to the sewer drain. Oh, that's true. Where at least on gravel, it's going to sit there. I have a question on uh, the utility trailer aspect on page two here. No more than two utility trailers. Talks about utility trailer for recreational vehicles, snowmobiles, ATVs. So I can put this in my backyard or my side yard if it's not, it must be set back five feet. On the lawn or turf or other surface, does that mean I could have the trailer with my snowmobiles on it? Mayor Mars, members of the council, yes, you could have snowmobiles on top of your trailer. Or a boat on your boat trailer. Or a boat on a boat trailer or whatever on a utility trailer. On the trailer. Yep. Okay. Total length would just be would be limited to twenty feet. Got it. Other questions, comments? I guess I want to commend staff. I know this was brought before us back in November, and you did take all of our points um, and and worked on them, and either removed it or clarified, and I, we do appreciate that. Other questions? I just wanted to comment that I know that you, it, you worked hard to remove the um, um, specification for the RVs, and I appreciate that. I, I think that was an issue for the residents, and, and uh, I'm glad that they can park their RVs. Thank you. Councilor Whiting. Yeah, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, thanks for your work on this. Uh, appreciate it. It's uh, always hard change, with change in some of our older areas of town, and I'm glad that we're not, you know, forcing change. We'd like to see it happen gradually, but we're we're not uh, forcing it. I don't think we could legally either. But um, 
we don't want to push that on some of the residents that ha might have some concerns or financial issues and uh, uh, cause them pain for something that they weren't expecting. So um, with that, uh, there's no other questions. I'd uh, move to adopt ordinance number 0 2019-003, a revision to zoning ordinance sections 151.141, 151.142, 151.143, 151.144, 151.145, 151.142, 151.142, regarding off-street parking. Second. I have a motion and a second by Councilor Brennan. Uh, that was a lot of code you're up to. I know, I, 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 nobody jumped on that. really well on that. <laughs> um, further discussion, discussion, discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion passes four to one. Thank you all very much. Let's move ahead then to 8B2, final plat of Lloyd's edition. Michael, welcome back. Good evening again, Mayor and Council. So this is the final plat, which uh, was formerly in a different, this will now be called the Lloyd's edition. So here's the property, the former uh, shingle recycling facility. So Lloyd's has purchased all of this. Um, they purchased this from the company that had acquired the assets of the former recycling company. And so we'll be running a similar operation here. So Lloyd's is a uh, construction dumpster, largely company. So they take construction waste, sort it, and uh, it gets reused or recycled, and some of it does go to the dump. They also do uh, supply a lot of aggregate um, from construction materials for roads, so that's what will be going on here. They have already received their CUP, so this project's good um, to go. So this will be the new plat with new easements. This will be where um, the Lloyd's uh, construction debris and other items are recycled and they're holding this as an out parcel to develop an office building. So um, that'll provide, I think, some good protection from the street for all the kind of heavy use that goes on behind here. Uh, questions of staff, Councilor Lehman? What's the difference between a packet and, oops, and what was on the table? So, uh, Mayor and Council, the only difference in your resolution is um, the there was one change made on item number, on page two under Roman numeral two, item number six. It will now be all non-paved exterior storage areas must be topped with class five material. Originally it said granite, and that actually is not required by code. Class five is what's required by code. Okay. So that'll be the areas... Um, Back here where they're storing aggregate, it doesn't make any sense for them to pave all of that because they'll actually be all aggregate. They'll be moving in and out um, from projects where it's been ground or out to projects for road construction. They are in the process of redeveloping the former um, tanks and all that was used as part of that recycling facility have been taken out. And this will now become kind of their tipping floor for construction debris they'll be building and reusing some, or modifying some of the buildings that are back here um, that were formerly uh, used for the shingle recycling will now be used for the construction materials recycling. And then they'll keep that office building that's up front as their corporate offices. And you can see here, this is kind of their ghost image of what an office building would look like here. Councilor Whiting. So no more shingles on this site and no more huge tanks of flammable liquids or? So mayor and council, it was interesting. Um, Coke Industries purchased the assets of the shingle recycler and despite their significant uh, funds, they could not make the process work. And so someday someone will figure out how to reuse them, but for now um, it didn't work. So what kind of recycled materials will be going into this site? So um, they'll have a smasher over here that will take concrete and make it into aggregate basically. Um, and over here will be, I'm sure you've seen, I think they're red Lloyd's dumpsters are at most single family construction sites and some of the larger projects. Everything gets dumped in, they bring it back here, it gets tipped out, they separate, separate out the wood materials to be recycled into other wood materials. Um, some of it goes down to DEMCON. I mean, all of that happens. They try to recycle almost all the construction debris from uh, construction projects. All right. Mayor. So this is, going to two lots, it, it was two lots. 
Mayor and Council says it was two lots, so it's going to Getting one. Reconfigure. Yes, yeah, one large lot, kind of this. L, and that's going to be Lloyd's. Yep. And then this office building in that other area, that's just, that's not going to be developed at this time, correct? Mayor and Council, that's correct. So this is purely, this is not a development approval. <coughs> this is just well, a know, plat. My question is uh, that that lot to the west is a is a rough looking lot undeveloped obviously will they try to grade that out and landscape that or make it more presentable than the current view of it so mayor and council they have been doing some uh rough grading in this area already i see that and um it's likely they'll come in and grade some of this out there are some really large heritage oaks across the front that they'll be preserving um, their goal really is to make this more of an office park in the frontier, and they're right now marketing that for potential users. No, I know. It just doesn't look like an area for right now for an office building because it looks more more industrial. So that's why I asked that question. And Mayor Council, it'll probably be something similar to the concrete company that's next door that has a nice looking office building. Um, that's really what they're trying to mirror over on this side. Then my follow up question is obviously, we vacated some easements in a previous motion earlier but we're getting the easements wrapped around the entire property that's correct okay thank you Councilor layman mayor that that lot two that you're showing on this new map that's the farthest west part of the old raceway parking lot yeah. where the cars were just parked to customers i guess that's really just a flat piece of ground with nothing well, it's, on. A, it's a rough piece of territory there to uh, this little Lot two that I don't know. It's gotten rougher over the years. Huh? It's gotten rougher over the years in between the, you know, RTS and kind of sandy, sandy ground. Right. But and, and Mayor Council, there was a lot of disturbance there when they put the new sewer line through. So I'm sure they'll probably be grading that back out. Further questions of staff? Questions of staff? If not, Michael, thank you. Thank you. One more question. Oh. Who's going to own, who owns the lot too? Is that part of the total? L Lloyd's will still retain ownership of that. Okay. They'll decide if they want to sell it off to somebody else or whatever. I want to release it. All right. Thank you. Counselors. <laughs> Councilor Brown. I make a motion to approve resolution number R2019. 006, a resolution approving the final plan of Lloyd's edition and move to its adoption. I will second that. We're going to second it. And Councilor Whiting? Uh, I'll offer a friendly amendment about the revised edition on the table if you want to reference oh, I'm that. I'm sorry. Is that a number? number? No, just uh, note that in your motion that you oh, accept the friendly amendment. Okay. That's okay to the motion maker. Yes, yeah. It's okay to the second. To the second so we're going to use the revised document on the table. Thank you. Further discussion? <laughs> discussion? Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. All right. 8B3 was removed. The B's get a night off. <laughs> In front of us next is 9A, which is the city bill list for our review. And with that, we would move to 9B, liaisons or administration report, and Councilor Brennan. Um, I went to Scale, um, and if, for people who don't know, Scale is the Scott County Association for Leaders and Effic Efficiency. It's where all of the um, local authorities get together um, in Scott County and talk about similar issues and ways to be more efficient. And um, at this meeting, we talked about the, or presented the 2019 legislative platform um, to um, Senator Platt, Pratt and uh, Representative Brad Tapke um, so that they can present these topics to uh, Minnesota legislature. Um, I also attended the Live, Learn, and Earn Housing Working Group, um, and I'll be going to that on a regular basis. Um, we met with the Met Council um, and talked about housing in Scott County. Um, I also attended the Academies of Shakopee presentation, which was great. Um, great presentation, and 
Um, so that's what I did there. Um, let's see, I also took a tour of my pillow, um, and I really appreciated that um, uh, Mr. Taylor gave us a tour, and it's a great business that's in the community. Um, I also attended the park master plan with um, Councillor uh, Lehman, and we are working on the future of the park systems. Thank you. Quick uh, comment. Uh, I noticed today in my email I had a survey from SCALE, and yeah. uh, I think you probably all got that, and if you encourage everybody as a former SCALE person, and yes. chair, yes. Uh, encourage uh, them to do that. That'd be, that'd be great. They're looking for your input. Yeah. I took that uh, survey as well. Culture Lehman. I've attended the 169 executive board meeting uh, as their treasurer. Um, Send it all that information to the city administrator. I saw the email went out to all, so everybody has it. Um, that's putting together our uh, legislative priorities from a transportation perspective relating to the 169 corridor. Um, now that has not been approved by the full board yet. I suspect it probably will. Um, February 20th, we're going to lease a room at the state building and get a hold of all of our representatives all the way along 169, so it's just not shock. He's uh, Mankato up past uh, to 694. Talk about some of the projects that we're looking at uh, for the future of 169 from a economic uh, standpoint. Um, suggestion. You're, you're all aware of all these projects, whether it's the uh, Min Pass Lane and the BRT on the from Marshall Road up to uh, 55 or 694. Um, there's a current project that's happening right now at 41 and 169. There's also a 282 Highway 9 issue in, in Jordan. It's pretty much the totality of the uh, corridor, so <coughs> working hard on that. Uh, I plan on going to the regular full board meeting and trying to make sure there's no hiccups in the process. I will be going to the Capitol on the 20th of February representing Shakopee for the 169 Corridor Coalition, and they're putting together the uh, Washington D.C. visit. I won't be going to that, but okay. uh, we're going to be sending um, the information that you received on that. A little bit has changed on that. Uh, we're probably going to be sending um, three or four, but of them three or four, they're also going to be representing other bodies, which their other <coughs> bodies are going to be funding the bill. So the 169 corridor coalition will not be picking up such a large tab of the expense on that. And we're partnering and meeting up with the Transportation Alliance at the same time. To try to get the biggest bang out of the buck of so many people all with the same interest. Um, did attend a park master plan with Councilor Brennan and I did take the scale survey today. Excellent. Um, Thank you. I did attend the Shakopee Heritage Society annual membership meeting. Great presentation of photos from the past and then the same photo roughly in the same location of, of being current. To see that over 50 years or even greater, uh, even some in succession over time, that was, uh, that was a great presentation. I attended the Shakopee Community Center uh, uh, fitness sampler. Uh, boy, our community center certainly has a lot to offer. I too attended the academy's presentation where we won a, or we received a plaque um, that's I think on display over there in the hallway. And I did go on the My Pillow tour. Um, coming up this Friday, I will, re I will attend the MLC legislative breakfast on Friday. And uh, that is my report. Calls for Whiting. I had uh, no liaison reports this past couple weeks. I do have a meeting tomorrow for uh, Minnesota Valley Transit, which I will be attending. I also attended the SH, the Heritage Society annual meeting, and that was some very interesting photos. Uh, she went to great length to try and match those photos up, and uh, sure um, some, some things I've never seen before, so uh, very interesting. Uh, I also been hearing some feedback from the community center, the indoor playground, is like at capacity, so uh, when these cold days come by, a great place to take your kids. Um, good things happening up there. <laughs> That's all I have. Thank you. Councilor Contreras. 
Well, I did attend the school board meeting. There were no updates. Um, but with that, I also on Saturday attended a, um, a Latino leader that was put by Mary Hernandez and St. Francis just to hear like the needs that are out in the community and try to see how we can start working on those. Pretty much, that's it. All right, next up, uh, Mr. Reynolds, our administration report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to touch really briefly on uh, some of the things that Mr. Kursky has done. I went and got the list off the printer uh, during the course of the meeting. Can we get him, bring him back up here and put him on yeah. the podium? Yeah. He's fine. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, just really quickly, and I'm not, I'm not even going to go into the economic development successes, and some of those you don't even know about yet. Those are coming hopefully uh, this week. But uh, uh, just, just in regards to kind of how we do business here in the city, uh, the implementation of 100% electronic submission and re reduced review times for all planning and building applications. New zoning code tables adopted, eliminating more than 120 pages of code. New sign code adopted, new PUD ordinance adopted, new landscaping and tree replacement ordinance adopted, and tonight, a new parking ordinance adopted. That's in a year, ladies and gentlemen, one year. So uh, he's obviously uh, got his staff uh, fine-tuned and, and working to address the issues of a growing city. Uh, now to, on to other things. I am a, a resident that has received one of the uh, Shakopee surveys uh, in my new home of abode. So this, I wanted to remind everybody that if you receive this pink copy, uh, it is asking your opinion as to what we do in Shakopee and how well we do it. Uh, I've already sent mine in uh, because there's two ways you can do this. You can do it, you can fill out the form, or you can go online. Now, it'll be open online at the beginning of February, I believe. Uh, and when that opens up, uh, there'll be a, a, uh, uh, a website that you can go to, which is http backslash backslash bit.ly backslash 2019 Shakopee survey. And we will have that online where you can, you can get it on our, our website. But uh, pretty in-depth, this is the second time we went with this company, which then benchmarks us with similar communities throughout the United States. Uh, I'm pretty excited to see the results of these as well. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Lehman, item number 10, other business. Well, I see somebody got really good and lucky and caught a uh, Jeep on it. Well, that one's over there. <laughs> What's the limit on them? Yeah, I think it's one or two per household. <laughs> one, one per season. Yeah. <laughs> Space for two per household, right? Yeah. <laughs> if you have paved parking out here. Um, well, wonderful. Uh, any other business before this council tonight? If not? I will recommend that ice is never safe. <laughs> and uh, probably not uh, driving out on a spring-fed lake either. Councilor Lehman. Motion to adjourn to February 5th. 2019 at 7 p.m. I have a motion and a second from <laughs> Councilor Brennan. Further discussion, discussion, discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned at 924. I missed a bill.